Okay, everybody. I think we're already like a little bit behind schedule, so let me get started. It's nice to see that so many people are interested in requirements, so I hope that's what you're here for. The following half hour, I'm going to talk a lot about requirements together with Mark. We both are project leads of the requirements modeling framework, a not so new anymore project that deals with requirements. Actually, there was a talk about this last year here at EclipseCon as well. So I'd like to give you a quick overview of what I want to talk about. So we want to talk how this new framework can be applied in the context of systems engineering. And we're also going to talk a lot about this relatively new standard about exchanging requirements called REC-IF, and then tell you, well, what does that mean in the context of Eclipse? and then show you what we've planned for the future. To make this a little bit more interesting, we're going to give you demos, lots of demos, three demos in 25 minutes. So this is kind of ambitious. So I um, will try to cut back on the theory and show you as much of the application as possible. But before I do that, I want to talk about systems engineering. And I'm sure you all know what I mean by systems engineering, building big distributed systems consisting of hardware and software like planes, cars, trains, and so forth. And in that area, requirements have always been really, really important because requirements played the role for communication. So big systems are typically developed by suppliers for manufacturers, and they communicate by requirements. They typically give the supplier a list of requirements. In the car industry, it's not unusual to have tens of thousands of requirements. And then they basically have to say, how are we going to implement that? And they also write long document. And that's how things are being done. Requirements are central for change management, for project management, and so forth. So requirements are kind of important. And in the car industry, several years ago, I think around 2005, 2006, the car manufacturers in Germany were kind of frustrated with how things worked because they had to either export the requirements that they had in their databases as PDFs, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, whatnot, but that was always lossy. There was always something missing. The other option would be to use proprietary solutions, but that again would require the suppliers to use the same tool chains. They didn't like that. So what they did is they said, let's create a new standard for exchanging requirements. And this standard is today called REC-IF. And it started as a um, data exchange format. So it's an XML format that had the capability of capturing everything that you would want to capture when you exchange requirements. So it would not only capture the requirements texts, but also the attributes that that requirement may have, the structure of the requirements, the linking between the requirements, which is very important because when you have a requirement, you want to know how the supplier intends to realize it, or you want to link it to an associated test or whatnot. So they put all that in this XML-based format. Well, so far so good, and over the years, this got actually more and more attention, and it went so far, far that today it is actually an OMG international standard. So this is an international standard that you can rely on. So that's great, and we thought, this is a good thing, let's make something out of that. So how do we do that? We did that by creating an Eclipse project called RMF, Requirements Modeling Framework. And this is a framework that allows working with data in this format. So it can read REC-IF, it can write REC-IF, it can manipulate it once you have it in there. It's based on EMF, so you have an actual EMF model that you can manipulate with all the standard EMF tools. So that's pretty cool but you can see framework, so we put a user interface on top of that. And that's that we call ProR, and that is a tool that allows you to work with requirements. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the whole thing looks like to make it like a little bit more concrete. For those who've worked with um, yeah, professional requirements tools, will probably like recognize a few characteristics, but think of it as Word and Excel and steroids with additional features. Oops, I didn't want to go here, I wanted to go there. So what you see here is the 
pro our user interface, but installed in a different Eclipse application. You can also run it standalone, but the reason why I do it this way is because there are three demos, and the second one builds on top of this one. So, so far, it should look familiar with all of you, because I guess you had Eclipse Con, so you know Eclipse. So we can create a new requirements model. And there's a bare bones model that has only the minimum features available. I want to create a different one, which is already pre-configured for the integration with other tools that I'm going to show later on. So let's do that. You get like a little wizard, just keep the defaults. And this is what you see first. So you have your project outline, and in the main editor, you see all the so-called requirements documents called specifications with the standard um, that are in here. You can have as many requirements documents as you want to. And down here in the properties view, you see there, oops, not having a mouse, you see the properties, and you see an outline. It's all like pretty typical Eclipse. It gets really interesting once you start opening the requirement document. And there's already one sample requirement in here. So it's row-oriented. It's a tree-based structure. And you see that we have already placeholder requirement in here. Let's create a new one, which you can do through contact menu. It's tree-based. You can create a child or a sibling. And you see that we have a number of different types. So this is kind of interesting. So for capturing your requirements, you may have different kinds of requirements. And inside this specification, you can create requirements types. And each type has a different set of attributes. What that means, I'm going to show you now. Let's create a different one, like a headline, to make it pretty. So this is our specification. So, and this is bold. The order is wrong, obviously. So let me just put this down here, indented in a tree structure. So you get the idea. You can put in your requirements text, but this first one is of type headline, so it doesn't have an ID because the headline doesn't need an ID, while the actual requirement has one that's automatically assigned. I'm going to give you a little running example, a traffic light system for pedestrians, so, and I'm going to write like a very short specification for that. And for that, I'm first describing the domain, how does our traffic light system look like. So I say the light for cars has the colors Red, yellow, green. Okay, nothing fancy about that. So obviously you want to work fast and efficient with the system, so rather than using the right clicking, I can just use a keyboard shortcut and now create the second requirement. The light for pedestrians has the colors red and green. Yeah. So far so good. And to make the whole thing kind of meaningful, let's add another one and say the lights must not be green at the same time. Okay. Uh, let me make this like a little bit smaller. So nothing that exciting about that yet. What's nice is that you have different data types. So this uh, requirement, as you can see down here, has a description, an ID, and a drop-down field, which is there to support a method that we developed. I'm not going into that right now but you have a drop-down which you can either change down here or up here. So, yeah, it's like better Excel. But what's really distinct about this is that you can also create traceability. So with dragging and dropping, you can connect elements like that. You can see that, hang on a second, make it like a little bit more visible as well. Okay. So now you have a right column Ah, uh, here we go. Sorry? Yeah, I, I want to keep the outline visible. That's, that's why I did it that way. So, but yeah, I could have done that. So basically, you now see that you have like one outgoing link, link here, one incoming link here, and you can unfold them. And now you see requirement one has an outgoing link, and here's the target. And that is something that you certainly can't do with, you know, like off-the-shelf tools except you buy a specialized requirements management tool. And these attributes, uh, these links can also have attributes. So if you would give this link a certain type, then you could also put in a description and so forth. I'm going to do that later, not now. And if you click on the target element, you see down here the properties of the target element. Now this view is of course customizable. If 
uh, requirement has 100 attributes, you do not see them all in that table view. You can customize the table view to only show the most important attributes, but every time you select an element, you see all the attributes down here. And just to show you what data types are available, this is a view that shows you the data type configuration. You see we have the requirement type. That's the one I've been using. And it has like these three attributes, a description, where I put the text in, this drop-down box, which is an enumeration, and the ID, which gets generated automatically. And you could create more here. And so you see what kind of types we have. We have XHTML, which is also used for embedding objects, images, and the like, and some standard attributes, as you would expect it to. One last thing, and then I'm concluding this demo, is you see here that the target element has the requirements text, which is kind of ugly. You'd rather want to see here in the outline, you see it too. Um, no, down here. So um, you would much rather see the ID of the target. So that too can be configured. So we can say what should be used for labels. And we see that right now it uses the description as a label, and we can add another feature. So this is what's happening right now. If it needs to show a label of anything, anywhere, it goes through the list and basically says, well, the, does this element have an ID? Yes, okay, then I'm going to show the ID. If it doesn't have an ID, it goes down the list and shows the description instead. And if it doesn't have a description, it just shows the internal ID to show something. So let me finish that up. And now you basically see that here we now see the, um, the ID of the target element, also here in the outline. But this element in the outline, the headline, still shows specification because it doesn't have an ID. So with that, I want to conclude this demo. Let me just delete this link for the next part of the demo, following shortly. So that concludes the first demo. So this is already quite useful, especially as there's interoperability with other industry tools. But first I want to talk about what it means in the context of the Eclipse ecosystem. So here at the architecture, you see that we have the core being based on EMF, the GUI sitting on top of that. But of course, you can put an arbitrary number of plugins into the system. You can integrate RMF in existing projects, simply via the update side. And if you've been to the top case talk yesterday, then you've already seen that they're planning on putting RMF into top case. So um, that's the general architecture, and that's also what I'm going to talk to you, because in systems engineering, you don't want to deal with your requirements in isolation. Your requirements are connected to everything, and they should be connected to everything. And that's what this is all about. So I'm going to tell you what activities are going on right now. So again, we are already talking to other projects where it makes a lot of sense to look for an integration with requirements. And again, top case, they're already underway with that. In general, if you have an ecosystem in systems development that is not Eclipse-based, now we finally have a standard for exchanging requirements lossless or almost lossless. And that is pretty exciting. So here are two tools, DOORS and Integrity, which will definitely support RecIF. These are pretty expensive industry tools. Many more, um, no? <laughs> Man, <laughs> Many more vendors are um, looking for supporting RecIF. And it's like really exciting to see how like this whole ecosystem is growing around RecIF. So that's pretty exciting. And there has been the comparison um, with the modeling environment, where UML, a finely unified modeling language, suddenly allowed an ecosystem to um, appear. And same here, we're pretty excited to see that RecIF really seems to allow this kind of ecosystem to appear. We, um, traceability is an important topic, traceability to and from requirements, because the whole project is based on EMF, we can use EMF for that. We already have been looking at uh, domain-specific languages. We already, um, in a prototype, managed to integrate 
and xText editor right into those table cells so that you have like all the functionality of uh, domain-specific languages available right into that editing environment with autocomplete and whatnot. Um, what I'm going to do show you next is the integration with formal models. So I hope I'm not scaring anybody. So who, who's, who knows what formal methods are? Nobody? Oh, no. <laughs> well, basically, um, look at something like UML. That is a modeling language which we would not consider formal, more semi-formal. But a formal model is a way to describe something with mathematics so that you can do reasoning about it with mathematical rigor. But what I'm going to show you, you could do the same with UML. It's just that we happen to have done it with the formal model. So what I want to show you in this next demo is how we are going to create a traceability between this little specification and formal mathematical model. And if you don't understand the formal model fully, don't worry about it. The concepts you could apply with other modeling languages as well, like UML. So the first step in an integration is to create a glossary, clear terminology. And I'm going to rename the traffic light for the cars and call it simply TL cars. And in this little prototype, which is actually grew out of an academic project, we simply use a very simple square bracket to tell the system, hey, this is a symbol. So you see it immediately recognizes that, and they're all red. OK. <laughs> I had this, unfortunately, before. This is like the latest development version. I fear that this is... Yeah, here we go. OK, so now I have to model these elements formally. I do that by creating um, an event B component. Event B is the formalism. And again, I mean, bear with me here. You don't need to understand that in detail. But here, I basically define formally our vocabulary, which I start with the colors, red, yellow, and green. I have to assign them to a set. That's how it is in this modeling language called colors. And I need an axiom that tells the system that the colors are red, yellow, and green. So do this like this. Again, and this is the point. Don't, don't worry about the details of the formalism. So. Red, yellow, green. And this kind of definition, you could also do that with some UML drawing if there would be an integration. So let's see what happened to our requirements. So in our requirements, we now see that the colors got blue. So the system already tells me these terms have already been formalized. Cool. So now let's do the same thing with the next one. And you see that the system already guides me. It says, hey, in this text, there are two symbols that I recognize. Are you sure they're not symbols? Yes, they are. So I tell the system, these are glossary entries, like that. And while I'm at it, I'm going to introduce the pedestrian light as a symbol. So you see how I can step-by-step step formalize the glossary. And again, you could have used a different formalism for that. So uh, let me switch the perspective. I can see all my model elements in their outline on the left. And there's an association. This is the definition of the traffic light for the cars. So let's next model the traffic light for the cars. I have to create a new formal component for that which is a so-called machine, which has variables. And here I introduce the traffic light for the cars and the traffic light for the pedestrians. And I need to type them. The system needs to know what they are. So type TL cars. That is just one value from the colors, right? need to reference the context, and then I can use autocomplete. 
and have that here. Do the same for the pedestrians. And if I go back to my requirements, oops, you see that I have a typo here. So the system tells me that I made a mistake here. So we already have traceability. And now that I have defined those variables, I can go into my machine and simply create that association with drag and drop. So um, here we go. So now you see that I have a trace here from um, right in the recurrence document, which I can unfold, and I see the target element is in my formal model. It's the typing of the car traffic light. And if I click on it, I'll see the actual element from the formal model down here. So that's pretty neat. I do the same here. Oops. Like that. And now you see here the typing of the traffic lights. Does anybody spot the problem? Or did I lose here? <laughs> well, there's like a tiny um, mistake in here. I defined the traffic lights for the pedestrians only to have the colors red and green. But if I look at the trays, it also includes yellow. We don't want that. So let me go back to the formal model and say, no, we don't want just colors here. Instead, we want apps. We want to have red and green only. If you now go back to the requirements document, first of all, if we click on here, you see that it immediately picked that up because this is just referenced. And second, you see that the tool told me that the target element changed. So this is built-in change management that tells you you need to validate this traceability again because something changed, in this case, the formal model. Same holds true for, for this part. So I can inspect it and then double-click it and dismiss it, and I'm done with that. And let's see. Well, I can also very quickly model the last element, just so you see it's possible. That's the safety requirement. And this is all predicate logic. So what we say there is basically that the traffic light for the cars being green and the traffic light for the pets being green. This means not, must never be. And again, we go back here, can create our traceability. Um, and see our safety requirement here. And I mean, for good measure, we could also change the symbols here. Um, I don't want to do that due to time constraints. But what you saw here is how you can create a model of your domain and your requirements and how you can create a traceability just with trace and uh, drag and drop and how you can have the system track the changes and tell you what's going on. So that was that. Um, quickly the outlook and then Mark is going to give the last demo, the integration with Enterprise Architect. But before we do that, I just want to give you a few highlights. We have like over a thousand downloads this year alone. The um, project was accepted officially as an Eclipse project, I think in November last year. So we're quite happy about that. We are on a bi-monthly release cycle, so we make a release every two months. The next one is due early November, version 0 0.5. There is, there are some industry activities going on. That's this ProStep forum. That's a non-profit organization that managed to get many tool manufacturers on the table, many users, mainly from the car industry, BMW, Daimler, Volkswagen, Audi on the table, and service providers like us, and basically got them all on a table and basically said, look, we want the standard, please make sure that your implementations of the RecF standard work together nicely. So this is really, really great. So they're taking care from the very beginning that you can export uh, RecRF files from doors and can read them with RMF. So there are some commercial activities. There are plenty of academic um, activities. There's the URL. And with that, I want to give over to Mark for the last demo, which shows how an enterprise architect oops, implementation